Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much indeed for coming. My name is Michael Scott. It's a great pleasure to see you here and to have a chance for the next 25 minutes or so just to give you some historical background. Right? What I want by the end of this 25 minutes is for you to be able to imagine yourselves as those Athenian citizens sitting down in the spaces that Emmanuel has described in the theater of Dionysus in Athens in 430, 429 BC, the date that we think Oedipus Rex was performed. And I want you to be able to fill your heads with the sorts of things that those citizens had in their heads as they turned to watch this drama. Now, we know it was not, as Emmanuel alluded to, the prize winner. Oedipus Rex, although we laud it today as one of the most perfect examples of tragedy, we know came in second place when it was first performed in 430-429. And you might, at the end of this, and when you put the play together with the historical context, you might want to think about why that was. It was, in fact, Aeschylus's nephew, a guy uh, called Philocles, who took first prize in this year. What's the story about? Many of you will be familiar with this. Just to kind of add a little something and a bit of background so that we can then link in the historical circumstance. It, of course, concerns Oedipus, who has come from Corinth, the city of Corinth, now is in Thebes, it's the ruler of Thebes. And it concerns his search for the murder of Laius to, in order to uh, uh, avenge that, the murderer of, of Laius, and thus to end a plague that is ravaging the city. Of course, he is unaware at the beginning of the play that the killer he's looking for is none other than himself. And as that truth finally unravels and is told, the play ends, and I'm not really spoiling anything here because I'm sure you guys know it, uh, Jocasta hangs herself, Oedipus gouges his eyes out in horror at what he has done, and the play ends in that, that pit of despair. Now, the so-called Theban cycle, these Theban stories, these stories of things that happened in the city of Thebes are very much part and parcel of Greek myth and culture. Right? Alongside the Trojan cycle that we're familiar with through Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, the Theban cycle, telling the story of Thebes, including the story of Oedipus, were equally important and well understood in epic as well. So it was the Theban cycle in epic, just like the Iliad and the Odyssey, and of course also in tragedy. Aeschylus had himself, in about the 460s and 467, produced his own trilogy concerning uh, the Theban cycle, of which we only have surviving the very last play, Seven Against Thebes. So this is not the first time, by any means, this story has been put on the stage in Athens. Sophocles takes a slightly different approach in that he doesn't do a trilogy. He's not doing the whole Theban cycle as the three plays performed in one Dionysia. He actually keeps coming back to this story for individual plays. So his Antigone, talking about what's going to happen later in the Theban cycle with Creon and Antigone, that was actually performed in 440 BC, so before our play. And he will, uh, po posthumously after his death, will also see him doing Oedipus at Colonus, the following on from Oedipus Rex, right, kind of later on in the fifth century. What's the play about? We know the storyline. What are the themes? The themes we want to have in our head when we're tying in the historical circumstance. You will be talking about this a lot more in the sessions to come, but just to outline some key ones. Fate, free will. Right? Just how much of what happens to Oedipus is his own choice? How much is he destined to commit the act that he does? How important uh, are oracles, right? those places the Greeks went to to find out the will of the gods? How, much can you e how easily can you misunderstand an oracle? How much does an oracle end up being a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? as it does in the Oedipus work? Individual versus the state. What's a ruler versus his community? How do you balance the needs, wants, desires of the individual and the, and the good of the individual versus the good of the wider community. And within that, what is the role of a good ruler? What does a good ruler look like? How does he behave? How does he act towards those around him, towards himself, and to his wider community? I'd like to think also, before we get on to the historical circumstance specifically, think about what we know about Sophocles. Who was this guy? Now, we know something about his life. It, all the evidence comes from a much later period in time. We can sort of 
pop through and see him. Here he is, we think, kind of uh, Sophocles. Um, he was a wealthy guy. He was born into a very wealthy family. He is not kind of a, anything other than a wealthy Athenian citizen, right, who had all the trappings of a fabulous uh, education in Athens, exposed to uh, and kind of able to take part in uh, and be a fully paid-up member of the Athenian, by now, obviously, democratic citizen body. In fact, when he was 15, he won, we're told, the honor of leading the boys' chorus in the victory paean, the kind of the procession full of song and dance to the gods, celebrating the Athenian naval victory over the Persians at the Battle of Salamis, right? which Emanuelo referred to the Persian Wars, the great turning point of the Persian Wars, the Battle of Salamis, which this year, just about, give or take, we're celebrating the 2,500th anniversary of, right? Sophocles was there as a young boy celebrating that moment. We know he went on not to just be a playwright, but he was also a general, a military general of the city. And he was standing alongside the great leader of the city, Pericles. We're going to come back to that name when uh, they were both kind of responsible for putting down uh, the rebellion on Samos, on the island of Samos. He was there, right? He was on the front line of battle during the time that he is also writing plays. And he was also a treasurer of the Athenian Empire. Right? So he was personally responsible, along with others, for documenting the monies that were extracted by Athens from its uh, members, its allies, uh, the subjugated uh, states within the Athenian Empire, and the money that came flooding into Athens as a result. This is a man who sees and has seen up close and personally everything that is uh, kind of crucial and important to understand about the city of Athens. Okay, so we understand a little bit about our guy Sophocles. We understand a little bit about the play and its key themes. So how do we put that into historic context? I want to start in 480 BC. Right? You might think, hang on a sec, the play was performed in 430, 429. That's 50 years in advance. But that is a single lifetime. Right? That's the lifetime of the older Athenian citizens who would be sitting in the audience watching this play. That's the kind of scope that they would have in their heads. And it also gets us back to that key moment, the Persian Wars, Battle of Salamis, the following year in 479, the Battle of Plataea, right? the moment when both Athens emerged as the savior of Greece and Greece fought back against the much, much larger Persian army. Crucial for Athens in that story was an oracle, the Delphic Oracle. Right? And here we have a picture supposedly of the Delphic Oracle, the Pythian priestess being consulted. Because Athens went to the Delphic Oracle specifically in advance of the Persian invasion of 480, 481, 480 BC, asked what they should do. And they were given a first response, which was, give up, go home. It's impossible to resist. They pushed back against that oracle. They asked a second time, and they were famously told, trust in your wooden walls. They came back to Athens. They sat in their democratic assembly. They debated what did that mean. Right? And they decided that it meant the wooden walls of their ships. They, as a result, evacuated the city, abandoned it, took to their fleet, and the subsequent victory at the naval battle of Salamis was what was the turning point of the war. This is a city who has intimate experience of engaging with oracles, pushing back against oracles, working out how to understand oracles, and having made the right decision about how to interpret an oracle, leading to their great victory. But it's also a city that, as a result of the Persian invasions, suffered complete destruction. Athens was abandoned. The Persians took it over in, in, just before the Battle of Salamis and laid ravage to the city. When the Athenians came back after the Persian invasion, they had to face a city in ruins, not the temples you see here in the photos, not the half-built temple that they were in the middle of building to their success at Marathon back from 490, but a city completely destroyed. And they actually, we know, made a decision to leave it like that. How weird is that? Your city has been completely destroyed. You are the victors. You come back home, but you don't rebuild particularly the sanctuaries, particularly the Acropolis that sits at the center of your city. You leave that in ruins until you have had revenge on the Persians. You may have won the battle. They may have left and gone home, 
but the Athenians felt they had not yet had revenge. We still see the impacts of that leaving the Acropolis in rubble right, to this day. These photos are taken just a couple of years ago of the walls that now today surround the Acropolis. You might be able to notice that in those walls there are column drums here and even bits of the triglyphs and metopes of the top architrave of the temple. The rubble that was left on the Acropolis in the aftermath of 484-79 was used and put into the walls forevermore a permanent memorial, a marker to the Athenians of what had happened to them and to their city during the Persian Wars. It's in this stage, in the 470s, that Pericles, our guy, comes to the fore, right? Here he is. Now, he first appears on our radar as a chorus supporter, right? The, the payer of a chorus for Aeschylus' is Persians, produced in 472. He's a powerful voice in Athenian politics through into the 460s. From 461 to 451, he's pretty much the only dominant voice of Athenian politics. And from 454 through until 429, he's elected as military general for the city pretty much every single year, with a few exceptions. In terms of what Oedipus is about, the ruler, the leader, right, we are in an Athens where there has been an almost permanent political leader of one kind or another in the form of Pericles, dating back to the 470s. It's 40 years. Right? It's been the dominant force in Athenian politics. He sees Athens through a tremendous period of change, and it's often his voice that people are listening to, but it's also, as we will see, him that people are railing against right? and questioning just how good a leader is this, just whose interest does he really have at heart. After 454, you have some momentous moments. You have Athens transferring the treasury of the so-called Delian League, the group of states brought together to seek revenge on Persia. You have them choosing to move that treasury from the island of Delos in the middle of the Aegean to Athens. Most people see that as the moment of the birth of the Athenian Empire. Right? This is no longer a league of different states. This is Athens leading its empire with the treasury, with the money now housed in Athens. Right? He oversees that. He oversees the final decision to rebuild the Acropolis once revenge on the Persians has been had. And of course, we know what that is going to look like. It's going to be the Parthenon, as part of a much wider building program that to this day we still talk about as the Periclean building program, right? included not just the Parthenon but a whole series of temples across a wide range of parts of Attica and the whole of the territory of Athens. And crucially, it was funded by the money coming in from the Athenian Empire. All of these structures are built with the money that Athens, the democracy, extracted, sometimes at force, from the subjugated members of its empire. He saw Athens through what we call the first Peloponnesian War in the period 454 to 451, the first tussle with Sparta. And it's at this point, by the end of the 440s, as the Parthenon is being completed, that we start to hear the first real notes of annoyance at Pericles. Is he taking on too much power? Is he being too lavish? Is he misspending the money of the state on all these vanity projects as opposed to things that it should otherwise be spent on? In fact, the Periclean building program, including the Parthenon, was actually challenged in the Athenian assembly by a guy called Thucydides, not the Thucydides, the writer of history, but a, a critic of Pericles. And it was debated whether or not they should continue with it. These great monuments that we take for granted nowadays almost were never completed. There was that many people worried about whether it was the right thing for Athens to be doing. The motion was defeated, Thucydides was exiled, the Parthenon was completed, Pericles continued in power. But it's also during the 440s that we start to see conflict emerging that Pericles is at the forefront of that will define the rest of the 5th century BCE. Uh, we have our beautiful statues talking about the richness and expense, right? Famously, the statue of Athena, Promachos, uh, Parthenos, inside the Parthenon, covered in gold. The Athenians used it as a bank, layering on more gold in the good times, taking it off when in the bad times. 
from 447, so while the Parthenon was being built, right, we start to see the main enemies of Athens emerge. And who are they? Thebes, Corinth, and of course Sparta. The key cities that will be the part of the tragedy you're going to be watching have been, as you are Athenian audience members, for the past 17 plus years, the enemies that you have been fighting on the battlefield. In 447, we know the oligarchs of Thebes conspired against the democratic factions within the city. Pericles was forced to, as a result, concede the loss of Athenian influence in the whole of Boeotia. Right? It's not like Athens has always been winning here. These are cities that have taken from Athens things they felt were theirs. The next year, Pericles has to machinate against more rebellions within the Athenian Empire, Euboea and Megara revolt. It's around this time that Sophocles, remember, was treasurer of the Athenian Empire. Right? He was seeing the money and the politics happening at first sight. In 439, there's another rebellion on the island of Samos, Samos over here, right, kind of thing, which Pericles himself goes to put down with Sophocles as his next go-to guy right, alongside him. Right? And you get a slight sense of the arrogance that people started to talk about Pericles having. What did he compare himself to when he'd put down the rebellion of Samos? Agamemnon, King Agamemnon. Now you might think this is not a good comparison. Right? We know what happened to Agamemnon. He got home and he had a slight accident in his bath. Right? But he stood there and he went, it took Agamemnon 10 years to take Troy. I've taken Samos in nine months can start to get a sense about how this guy might not be as magnificent and perfect as we have made him out to be in more recent history. By 435, Corinth comes on the scene as the new enemy of Athens, right? They're attacking Corsaira, modern-day Corfu, over up here, right, which is an Athenian ally at the time. In fact, by the next year, Pericles concludes an official alliance with Corsaira, thus becomes an official enemy of Corinth, Athens militarily intervenes and then goes after some of Corinth's own, Corinth's own territories in other parts of the Greek world. Right? So by the time we're into the 430s, just a couple of years before this play is put on, Athens has been at war with Corinth as it has been with Thebes. And it's the Corinthians that lobby Sparta to lead the alliance, <coughs> the Peloponnesian alliance, the Peloponnesian League, that will one day, in a couple of years' time, take on Athens in the Great Peloponnesian War. At the same time, in 431, just two years, a year perhaps before this play was put on, Thebes once again attacks Athens' final remaining territory in Boeotia, the city of Plataea. It turns out to be a very bad decision by the Thebans. They lose, right? But on the other hand, it shows quite how real this conflict is, even before the Peloponnesian War has officially kicked off. And while this is happening, while Pericles is calling himself Agamemnon, winning victories, losing battles, the enemies of Athens are coming into focus in terms of Corinth, Thebes, and Sparta. At home in Athens, Pericles is also not getting a particularly good rep. Partly that's to do with his personal life, he was married, then got rid of his wife. Some sources say he sold his wife on to another person. Uh, took up with Aspasia Miletus, you can see in the middle, right? Who was a non-Athenian, kind of an outsider, someone the Athenians distrusted on a regular basis. He was also great friends with a philosopher, Anaxagoras, who equally came under the kibosh of the Athenian state during this period. So. His partner, Aspasia, was tried for embezzling and corrupting the women of Athens. The man he'd employed to build the great statue of Athena, Parthenos, that I showed you, Phidias, he was being tried for embezzling and overusing funds. And Anaxagoras, his mate, had, his philosophical mate, had been attacked and imprisoned for his religious beliefs. All of this machinating around the figure of Pericles and gives you a sense of how much people distrusted him. It, once again... The assembly officially debated and attacked Pericles for his ostentatious use of money and his profligacy, how much he was benefiting himself rather than others. 
Some of the quotes, Plato, Gorgias, as I know, Pericles made the Athenians slothful, garrulous, and avaricious by starting the system of public fees. Later, Plutarch and his life of Pericles, many others say that the people were first led on by him uh, into allotments of public lands, festival grants, and distributions of fees for public services, thereby falling into bad habits, becoming luxurious and wanton under the influence of his public measures, instead of being frugal and self-sufficing. Pericles becomes the guy who is responsible, in some people's eyes, for leading Athens astray, making them soft, luxurious, not the self-sacrificing, frugal people that they had been when they'd won the Persian Wars. And it's at this time, 431, that Sparta invades and starts the Second, uh, the, the second Peloponnesian War, the Great Peloponnesian War that will last for the next 30 years. As that war starts, Athens has a leader, Pericles, been around a long time, but he's actually distrusted, and people are uncertain and unhappy with him. He advocates that they abandon the territory of Athens, withdraw into the city, and just wait it out. Because right? they're navally, and on the sea, they're supreme, but by land, they are not against the Spartans. So for the next two years, 431 and 430, Sparta ravages the territory of Athens and Attica. Right? And the Athenians cower inside their city. You guys, watching this play in 430-429, have just survived two seasons of having your land, your homesteads, out in the countryside, ravaged. And what else has come? Plague. Don't forget Oedipus Rex. Why are we desperately seeking the murder of Laius? Because of a plague that's ravaging the city. Athens is being decimated by plague. It loses a third to a half of its citizen body to the plague. Pericles' sons will die. Pericles dies in 49 of the plague. So what do we have here? We have an Athens right? watching this play, 430, 429 BC, in the midst of war, the great Peloponnesian war that has kicked off and will last who knows how long. We have an Athens, a citizen body whose lands have been ravaged in the last two years, who will know, who will have family members, who will have friends who have died of the plague. All potentially the result of the decision of one man, Pericles, and his military strategy to evacuate the countryside and come in and hide within the city walls. You're watching a play set in Thebes, one of the great enemies of Athens, about a ruler who's come from Corinth, another enemy of Athens, to Thebes, and who's now, his decisions, his actions, will have massive ramifications on the citizen body of Thebes. Athens has been used to having a leader, Pericles, around for the best part of the last 40 years, whom they are, at best, concerned about, lukewarm about, worried that he might be too powerful, too all-encompassing, too concerned for himself, who has family connections and a family personal life, which is, to a certain extent, questionable. And you are about to watch a play about a ruler who equally has all of those things. Don't forget that the most famous quote about Pericles from Thucydides is this. Pericles, indeed, by his rank, ability, and known integrity, was enabled to exercise an independent control over the demos, the people of Athens. In short, to lead them, instead of being led by them. For as he never sought power by improper means, he was never compelled to flatter them. But on the contrary, he enjoyed so high an estimation that he could afford to anger them by contradiction. Whenever he saw them unreasonably and insolently elated, he would, with a word, reduce them to alarm. And on the other hand, if they fell victim to a panic, he could at once restore them to confidence. In short, what was nominally a democracy became in his hands government by the first citizen. You are all, as you watch this play this afternoon, citizens of Athens. You have in your heads the last 50 years of history that has taken Athens from another city in Greece to being the city in Greece at the center of a great empire with fantastic and extraordinary buildings. But you are also citizens of a city-state 
that is troubled and worried about the influence of a man who has been dominating politics for 40 years. And you are also citizens of a city whose countryside and your own personal territory and wealth has been ravaged. And you are citizens who have lost family members to plague. All having to decide in the immediate aftermath of Pericles' death in 49 from the plague, who you should be listening to next, who should be leading you next, and what kind of qualities do you want in them as a ruler? 